Hello, everybody, and welcome to another CARE podcast. My name is Oliver Grundman, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Boissonneau. Welcome, Dr. Boissonneau. Would you mind introducing yourself? Not at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jeff Boissonneau. I'm an assistant professor of clinical and health psychology here at the University of Florida. Um, I've been involved with CARE since I was a trainee, so uh, at least 10 years at this point. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Most of my work is kind of at the intersection of alcohol use and pain. Um, so that's kind of what we'll be touching on today. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. So uh, you, you already kind of touched a little bit on your long history with the care center. And what actually got you interested initially in the field of addiction research, even potentially before coming to UF and getting involved with the care center? Yeah, so my interest in alcohol research and um, addiction research uh, goes back to when I was an undergraduate. Um, I was very interested in stress and stress physiology. Um, and I, was, I, I went down the rabbit hole as an undergraduate and wrote my honors thesis actually on um, uh, uh, toxin-induced stress responses. Um, and one of the, uh, actually two of the substances I focused on were MDMA and alcohol as part of that. Um, and so when I was applying to graduate schools, I was very interested in continuing to do more work at, um, along the lines of stress physiology, stress response, and how that relates to substance use. But I was sort of um, flexible in what that would look like. So I applied to a bunch of different kinds of programs and ended up sort of trying to decide between um, doing uh, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis research at University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and uh, going into the uh, what's now the biomedical science PhD program here at UF. But when I was there, it was called the IDP or interdisciplinary program. Um, so I ended up coming to UF um, and uh, I was really interested in the kind of variety of research that was being done here and the opportunity to rotate through a few labs and see what really meshed with me. Um, and what I learned is that for myself, um, although the topics were very interesting, um, I was not cut out for animal research. Um, and uh, it just, it just didn't click with me quite the same way as, uh, as human work did. So I ended up uh, joining uh, Sarah Jo Nixon's lab uh, here in the Department of Psychiatry. And so I spent the next, um, I guess, five and a half years doing a PhD and then another a little bit less than a year doing a, a, a postdoc with her. Um, and as part of that experience, I worked in um, the a couple of different areas, but largely looking at the acute and chronic effects of alcohol on neurocognitive function. So stress was a part of that, but also working memory, attention, uh, those sorts of constructs, and then um, applying a variety of behavioral assessments that included complex behaviors like driving simulation, but also EEG um, and uh, event-related potentials. So yeah, and that was really looking at the effects, uh, differential effects of alcohol and cognitive function in older and younger social drinkers. Yeah, that's fascinating. So uh, when I think about alcohol and MDMA, MDMA mm -hmm. being ecstasy, uh, right. I, I think of uh, really two drugs that are obviously often used in social settings or when you go out partying, you know, mm -hmm. by primarily, I mean, alcohol has a, has a wider social range, I would say, MDMA, MDMA probably a little bit narrower kind of, when you talk age range wise, potentially more younger cluster of mm -hmm. users. Uh, but stress response, which is kind of interesting, uh, when we talk about that, uh, is it more physiological or also on the psychological scale, uh, a stress response? Are you, are you entirely looking, is that still something you're looking at right now? Or is that uh, when we talk about stress and in terms of cortisol release, is that, you know, more on that level? So at the time as an undergraduate and when I was working with Dr. Nixon, um, largely we were interested in that HPA axis, the mm -hmm. cortisol function, um, secretion, um, how that related to cognitive performance in people in recovery from, from alcohol and other drugs, um, but particularly alcohol. These days, so um, after I um, concluded training with Sarah Jo, um, I went on to 
uh, a pain research fellowship also here at the University of Florida. So I've been here a while, um, <laughs> about 14 years now um, in various roles. But um, so I went on to do a pain research fellowship because I wanted to get a little bit back to um, back to the stress focus because we were doing acute alcohol challenge and that that cognitive function piece, which I found fascinating, but I wanted to integrate stress a little bit more into that. And so these days, actually, although I, you know, my portfolio is kind of evenly split between substance use and pain research, I'm really, um, I haven't done much work directly with, say, HPA axis function for a while. I'm more interested these days in sort of um, psychosocial um, approaches to understanding stress and negative affect, um, particularly how pain-related negative affect can lead to uh, pain self-management uh, behaviors using alcohol and other substances, and also how the acute use of alcohol and other substances can affect pain. So we're kind of both sides of that relationship we're actively pursuing right now. Huh. So in other words, when you look at the use of alcohol and other substances, potentially for this, if I understand you correctly, for the self-treatment of chronic or acute pain conditions, right? That's right. Hmm. Uh, so when I think about pain, um, there's obviously a broad spectrum of subjectively perceived pain, how we perceive pain, how we perceive pain in different situations, sometimes uh, situational pain perception, how uh, we in the late 1990s, pain was kind of seen as like a vital sign or defined as a vital sign. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we if we still hold on to this kind of um, uh, definition of pain as a vital sign. Um, but how would you then say when we talk about the different ways in which, for example, alcohol can influence perception or both in a, in, a, in a physiological and psychological or um, also social manner, how, how that can be influenced by, by alcohol? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of good questions in there. Um, and the, the truth is that I think it is, we're sort of at, we're at an early stage of understanding all of the nuance underlying these interactions between pain and alcohol use in particular. And I'm going to focus mm -hmm. on alcohol because that's really more where my work is and interest is uh, professionally. Um, but I think there's a couple different angles. One is that, um, so just to kind of set the stage, pain self-management using alcohol is actually quite common. Um, you know, the data that I've seen are 25 to 30% of people with pain uh, actually will self-manage their pain at least some of the time using alcohol. Um, so the evidence we have, which admittedly is a little bit, um, it's, a, it's a relatively small literature base looking at the acute effects of alcohol on pain response. And then there are different components of pain response, which I'll touch on in a second um, to get back to other aspects of your question. But the best evidence we have at the moment is that there does seem to be a dose dependent effect of alcohol on pain response. And particularly that's looking at pain intensity in these laboratory pain paradigms. But that's in people without chronic pain and people who um, typically are non-problem drinkers. Hmm. So that's a pretty, that already is a pretty narrow group that we're studying. Um, so we actually know relatively little about how alcohol affects pain response in people who have a chronic pain condition, for instance. Um, so that's some of the work we're doing now is we are, um, I'm in the last year, actually a no cost extension, thanks to COVID, um, of an R21, where we are looking at the acute effects of alcohol on um, uh, oral facial pain. So mm -hmm. particularly chronic jaw pain or TMD. Um, and so we evoke, uh, we evoke that pain in the lab using uh, what we call pressure algometry or pressure induced pain. Um, and we're looking at how alcohol can alter the um, both pain threshold, pain intensity associated with various pressure levels, and also the extent to which people perceive relief from pain after drinking. Mm -hmm. um, and 
So that that's an aspect which previously had not been explored. Um, you know, so we're still in the middle of that, especially recruiting the uh, the sample of people with chronic pain. Our initial evidence uh, or the initial uh, analyses uh, we've started in the people without chronic pain, so that control group where recruitment is a little bit easier. Um, we do see that alcohol is increasing pain thresholds, so uh, sort of clear analgesic effect there, effect on pain sensitivity. It's also lowering uh, pain intensity to three different set pressure levels that we use. So those um, are intended to be above the typical pain threshold, but not so much that somebody would uh, experience excruciating pain or intolerable pain, um, but it's reducing um, reducing pain intensity across those levels. Um, and it's also, uh, people are reporting significant uh, increases in perceived relief relative to a placebo beverage that we give them. <laughs> um, so it does seem that there is, um, there are both these quantitative changes in sensory function, as well as people perceiving sort of a relief or negative reinforcement um, from the alcohol administration. Huh. Uh, is certainly uh, fascinating. Uh, and also, to some degree, I guess it, it, it confirms a little bit the use of alcohol in way times back when it was used as an anesthetic, you know, when mm -hmm. we didn't ha really have anything else uh, uh, for, uh, for surg surgical purposes. Not that it really necessarily took away all the pain, but it increased at least the pain threshold a little bit uh, and potentially helped some folks. Uh, Wow, that's that's fascinating. So uh, obviously, as you as you already indicated, a lot of work still remains to be done mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, both chronic pain and also, um, I guess, when it comes to uh, a, a dose response relationship, because um, alcohol can also have that stimulant effect uh, in in some doses, right? So, do you do you see any? Uh, any any effects there at, at where where alcohol can have that stimulant effect uh, on pain? Yeah. So another study that we're doing right now is actually quite similar, where we're also doing acute dosing in the laboratory setting. So we're bringing up people to up a, a, about to the legal limit or 0.08 grams per deciliter uh, BAC. Um, that is actually go um, in the scanner. So we're doing that in the MRI. We're looking at neural mechanisms underlying. Um, alcohol analgesia or changes in pain response associated with alcohol. Um, and as part of that study, we are measuring different components of subjective response. So things like stimulation and sedation, uh, for instance. Um, one of the things that we really wanna do, and we haven't done it yet, um, is to look at these association between changes in stimulation and sedation and pain response, and also that um, perceived relief. So what is that going to, how are those going to be uh, related to one another? We do see, I can tell you that, um, you know, consistent with many other groups that especially as the BAC is rising, people do tend to report more uh, feelings of stimulation. Huh. Um, and then on the descending limb, um, as is fairly typical, people report less stimulation and more sedation associated with that, even at the same BAC. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I, I definitely, uh, I, I, I'm definitely interested already to, to hear more about this. So uh, there are probably a, a number of publications of yours out there that already address some of these, uh, these findings. So um, looking forward to that. Um, where do you see your work uh, making an impact on substance use disorders and the future of addiction research in? On, on a broader scale, since you are kind of splitting your your current work between pain and substance use disorders and alcohol use disorder in particular? Yeah, so I, th I think one of the biggest for me is that pain is really, I think, an underappreciated component of and a risk and risk factor for substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. So kind of case in point, um, Dr. Nixon and I a few years ago um, looked at uh, a couple of relatively basic pain measures um, in a sample of treatment seeking people uh, with substance use disorders that she had recruited for a variety of studies. 
Um, and so we looked at the prevalence of pain conditions and the severity of pain in people's perception that pain was contributing to their substance use. Um, and it was the, to my knowledge, the first time that had ever really been done in people who were treatment seeking. Um, and what we found was that uh, people in that setting reported pain uh, and persistent pain at a level that, at a rate that was much higher than in the general population. So we also had a control group of community dwelling folks without substance use disorder as part of that sample um, who were around, I would say the national average of about 30% in terms of reporting persistent pain. Um, in the treatment seeking sample, it was a, over 60%, so double. Um, and that was sort of across the chronic pain conditions that we looked at. So we looked at chronic low back pain, neck pain, knee pain, fibromyalgia, chronic headache, um, those sorts of things. Um, and pretty much across the board, those rates were elevated in people with chronic pain. I mean, people uh, in treatment for substance use disorder. So I think that, um, you know, what my work specifically, it's hard to know exactly what the impact is gonna be when you're in the middle of it, right? But um, what I hope is that it helps one, us better understand both neural, because we're doing that MRI work, um, but also psychosocial mechanisms that are underlying pain and substance use interactions. So um, case in point, we are working on, or we recently published a paper, uh, one of my students, Aaron Ferguson was the lead author where we elaborate a, a theoretical model for pain as an antecedent for substance use. And so we focused on alcohol and cannabis, opioids and nicotine uh, in that paper, because those are the substances that have been most canonically associated with pain, um, either self-management or um, hyperalgesia, that sort of thing. So um, what we did there was we focused on psychosocial mechanisms. Um, so things like pain attitudes, negative affect, um, impulsivity, uh, beliefs about how alcohol or other substances will affect pain, um, because those are all targetable constructs. So my hope is that we can go in and start testing that model empirically um, and hopefully figure out which of those pathways um, or which of those constructs and, and risk factors might be most targetable and most effective um, to help prevent relapse, for instance, or prevent substance use disorder in the first place in people who have pain. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one contribution I hope we can make. Um, the other is just to um, kind of, I, I think both substance use disorder and chronic pain are conditions with signif significant stigma associated with them. And I think that can be uh, compounded uh, in people who experience both. And as we saw from our data with uh, Dr. Nixon's sample, um, that's most people who were treatment seeking also had significant pain that they were dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I think that by better understanding those mechanisms, hopefully we can, um, you know, educate healthcare providers and people in, in the patients themselves that this is a normal uh, experience that they're having. And this is um, something that is addressable and hopefully that proper pain management uh, in the context of treatment could be a powerful tool to help prevent relapse or, or for harm reduction in people who may not be, uh, you know, ready to seek treatment in kind of that traditional context. Yeah. What, what, what I found uh, enlightening in that, because I, you may be aware that I'm doing some research on Kratom is that mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it is really the, the stigma of both uh, inadequate, often finding inadequate uh, relief of pain through currently available uh, pain treatment options, because mm -hmm. they are so limited, uh, folks either are uh, reluctant to seek help uh, because they don't want to take opioids or they know that opioids are leading to dependence, um, have a dependence potential uh, or NSAIDs uh, are also associated uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like opioid, uh, like uh, ibuprofen or uh, aspirin or like are also associated with uh, adverse effects and outcomes. Um, so we don't really have that many other options uh, in terms of pharmacotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so they really stuck with not much to, to go on in, in that realm. 
and then adequate pain relief is really what they are seeking and they kind of left out uh, to dry in many, in many regards. Uh, and once they go on opioids, there is obviously then, um, if they have a, a potential prior substance use disorder, um, then they, they might be more likely to, to actually engage um, and, and potentially develop a dependence to it. So yeah, I, I see that as a, yeah, I think that's a, and I haven't, haven't thought of pain as a potential antecedent um, for, for a substance use disorder. That's, that's a great point. One of the things that we've worked on recently that I've found really interesting, and, and Aaron is following up on this study, but um, my postdoc, Bethany Stinnett, did this initial work. Um, we used a laboratory-based pain induction technique uh, where we induced muscle soreness using eccentric exercise um, and looked at effects on motivation to use alcohol. Um, and this was in people who were primarily social drinkers, although we didn't limit it based on AUD symptomatology, but that it fell out that they were mostly under the cutoffs. Um, what we found was actually gender specific effects. So um, that musculoskeletal pain either increased or maintained demand in men, whereas women, and this was surprising to me, actually tended to decrease demand after induction of pain. Um, so I think there's a lot of nuance to this. Um, you know, we didn't measure all of the things that I would, you know, that I would now, but hey, it was pilot work. So that's, you know, that's what you do. Um, so I'm really interested to see, yeah, to see all the nuance that underlies these relationships and, and also the extent to which those changes in motivation cha um, translate into actual use. So Aaron is doing a little bit more, um, Aaron Ferguson is doing more work with sort of longitudinal assessment after muscle soreness induction to look at how um, those changes in motivation translate to actual use of uh, alcohol. And she's also looking at cannabis and mm. simultaneous use of alcohol and cannabis. So that's gonna be really fascinating. Awesome. Well, I, I definitely look forward to hearing more about this uh, because I mean, alcohol is so commonly used in a recreational setting in just a social setting. And then that connection with pain, I think is, uh, and, and then potentially as an alcohol use disorder is, is definitely very powerful and has very broad applications. So uh, the last question um, that I would like to ask you, when it comes to the, the challenges that you face um, in particular on a broader basis as a researcher in addiction sciences, um, kind of what has been kind of your biggest challenge uh, that you see facing the research community and society at large related to substance use disorders and addiction? Hmm. <laughs> Where do you start? That's the question. <laughs> I mean, we, so we've already touched on stigma. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I think, um, you know, it's very common for people who, in, who have substance use disorders, of course, to internalize that stigma. And then that leads to all sorts of issues as well. Um, so I think there's broad issues related to assessment and treatment and seeking treatment for uh, substance use disorders. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, our work where we are sort of zooming out a little bit and saying, look at the common comorbidity of substance use disorder and pain might help to especially on the provider side, realize, oh, I should be assessing for um, you know, substance use in people who are presenting with primary pain concerns and vice versa, right? Because the, they have that reciprocal association. Um, I think that uh, there are enormous issues in terms of disparities regarding access to care. Um, you know, along um, racial and ethnic lines and um, socioeconomic status, you know, huge contributors to disparities in terms of access to care for substance use disorder and, and pain, actually, for that matter. Um, I think that uh, another challenge, uh, and this is getting to the pain side a little bit more, is that we tend to think very much um, in terms of a, uh, uh, we want a magic pill approach for treating pain um, and so far, that really has not worked out very well. Um, you know, it's one of the most sobering um, 
uh, things I learned as part of my postdoc working with uh, Mike Robinson here in clinical and health psychology is that the when you look at the large meta-analyses in terms of efficacy of frontline opioid analgesics for chronic pain, it's quite poor. <laughs> Yeah. It's quite poor. And that's the kind of treatment that we tend to like to prefer as a society and as providers and often as patients as well. So I think that one of our challenges in as researchers and communicators and scientists is to help break through that a little bit and say, hey, pain is really complex. And we're not just targeting a single receptor or a single pathway or a single belief, right? Like we have to work together and integrate all of those different levels of inquiry and understanding um, to develop treatments. And, you know, the truth is that we actually have some treatments that work well, like these interdisciplinary pain care centers and, um, you know, those sorts of things where psychologists are working hand in hand with psychiatry and pain management and surgery and physical therapy and, you know, all of these different disciplines. Um, but of course, access to those services is very limited because they're expensive um, and somebody has to pay for that. So, um, you know, these are these are really big problems. I don't actually I'm, maybe they're too big for the question, but, <laughs> but they're what jump out to me as the primary sort of challenges that we face in terms of translating um, our science and targeting our science, and then also implementing that in, in a meaningful way that helps a patient. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a, that these are great points. Uh, and, and they would require, I think, a, a whole change in perspective from a lot of stakeholders, including the patient, but also mm -hmm. including providers, as you said, that it's not just taking a magic pill or taking that one pill that takes away the pain and solves the problem um, because it doesn't actually cure the underlying disorder. It doesn't cure the actual underlying problem. Uh, it just takes away the pain, which is an indicator of inflammation or whatever is going on um, at the base of it, right? So uh, I, I see that all the time that, you know, people complain about when it's osteoarthritis or if it's lower back pain, that it's uh, more of a behavioral issue, right? That either poor nutrition or you you have a, a desk job where you sit for hours at a time and it's not, the pain is just a consequence of behavioral adaptation mechanisms for a very long period of time. So That's you great. actually need to change something in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very hard. We are creatures of habit. Uh, and I, I do not take exception to myself from that, to be honest. So I don't no, miss I, as much. <laughs> I, I don't either. And the, you know, you, you raise a great point about knee osteoarthritis, for instance, such an interesting condition. Um, and one of the reasons getting to your point is that there's such a poor correlation between, you know, the radiographic findings um, sort of across a population of people with knee OA, um, where some people will have on imaging relatively minor pathology at the joint, um, but really severe pain. And also the opposite, people who have, you know, bone on bone grinding, but very low pain and relatively low disability um, associated with it. And so I think one of the things that I find so fascinating about pain is, is that heterogeneity in the experience. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Subjectivity plays a, a great role in that as well. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, you know, attitudes are a huge part of it. Um, fear avoidance behaviors, all of that stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're complex. We're complex creatures. For sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Boissonneau, that's about all the time we have, but this is fascinating work and I really look forward uh, to reading more about it. And I encourage everybody else who's listening today uh, to um, go to your lab's website. You have a, a website uh, at the University of Florida and you are posting there, you, you're sharing your findings and also obviously on PubMed and the like and on the CARE website, updates are also provided about what your lab is coming up with. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time today. This is fascinating. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, really appreciate it.
Okay. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And there will be a next podcast coming up with another faculty of the CARE Center. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody.